Good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, this is a, another Facebook Live here on blackdoctor.org. As many of you know, I am Ellis Dean, the Director of Digital Programming at blackdoctor.org. And, you know, I, I noticed something, I have a pattern, right? And uh, with all the program that we do on, on Black Doctor, and some that I host and some that I produce, the shows that I enjoy the most are the ones I typically put at the last show of the day. <laughs> okay. So I guess we're like, I'm going to end on a high note. And this is one of the shows that I enjoy the most. This is What to Know from Dr. Mo. We started, we did her inaugural show two weeks ago and got such a wonderful, wonderful response. And we're so happy to have her back here again today to continue this process. Because this show, if you didn't know, Dr. Mo, we're gonna keep rhyming. It's like I'm freestyling right now. But if you didn't know, this show is all about you. This is about getting you questions, your questions answered from Dr. Mo. So if you've got any questions, any health-related questions, any wellness questions, I that last time we had questions about vitamins and what kind of vitamins we should take. We had all kinds of questions. This is about this is a QA show. This is all about you and and getting those questions answered from Dr. Mo. So that's why I love it so much. Also, because Dr. Mo is wonderful. She's a wonderful person. She's a very, very, very knowledgeable doctor. So don't think anything is off limits. Now, one thing that we were amiss about last year that we did get a chance to do that we're going to do it this time is we got to tell you who Dr. Mo is. We just jumped into the show and we just started going and we just started riffing and, and doing our thing. And, and it was great. And you all really jumped into it. Uh, shout out to the folks that were in the chat room. So again, if you're watching us now, drop in the comment section, let us know where you're watching from. We'd like to know where you're watching from. Uh, please shout out your, your zip code, your area code, your high school, whatever you want to put in there. We like to know where you're watching from. And while you're doing that, I want to tell you just who Dr. Mo is, because I think this is incredible. So Dr. Monique Gary, aka Dr. Mo, she's a board certified fellowship trained breast surgical oncologist and medical director of the cancer program for Grandview Health in Salisville, Pennsylvania where she also serves as the director of the breast program. You might see in Dr. Mo on Wednesday, she's on with Ricky Fairley on the Doctors Inn, and that's her Ricky Fairley show about breast cancer. Dr. Co Dr. Mo, uh, Dr. Gary, sorry, I keep saying Dr. Mo, completed her medical degree at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and her general surgery training at, the, at UMass, followed by Breast Surgical Oncology Fellowship at Georgetown University. Dr. Gary holds faculty appointments at PCOM, Temple University, School of Medicine, Penn Medicine, and Texas Christian University, UNT Health Sciences in Fort Worth, Texas. In addition, Dr. Gary is a daily public health expert for Radio One stations and the weekly co-host of a national cancer focused education advocacy program, The Doctor Is In, here on BlackDoctor.org. She is published in multiple peer-reviewed journals and is an invited speaker at national cancer meetings annually. She is a past committee chair and member of the board of directors for the American Society of Breast Surgeons and a medical advisor for the National LGBT Cancer Network. And there is more stuff, but <laughs> we got so much show, we are going to get to your questions. So. Yeah. You even have to say all that. You could have just said she's a graduate of Florida A and M University well, with my ratless ass <laughs> and a child of God. That's it. That's all they need to know. That's all they need to know, really. I could have stopped there. I said she would fan you. So you know, you know she's special. That, that's already. So shout out to folks that are watching from Connecticut. We've got um, Durham, North Carolina, Brooklyn, New York, Winter Haven, San Francisco. Uh, please keep dropping that in the chat room. We'd like to know where people are watching us from and get your questions. So we've got we've got a, a, you know some some things we want to talk about tonight. Uh, it's Women's History Month. There's a lot of months, right? There's a lot of medical months. So it is Women's History Month. That's not a medical month. That's just a general women's history. We also have this is Kidney Health Month. This is Colorectal Cancer uh, Month. What, what, whatever months are we, are we on, uh, Doc? Let's see. We covered colorectal cancer, women's history. Uh, Thursday is triple negative breast cancer day. And if yes. you don't know what triple negative breast cancer is, put a question mark in the chat because every person watching needs to know what triple negative breast cancer is. Absolutely. If you are a black woman and you have a family history, or, and even if you don't have a family history, 
you need to know what triple negative black breast cancer is because it impacts us, it impacts black women at a higher rate and it is one of the more aggressive. Mm -hmm. It gets diagnosed earlier and, and I'm we're talking with a cancer expert. So <laughs> if I say something wrong, I'm gonna get corrected. I see question marks in the chat already. This is, <laughs> this is an important conversation and we, we might wanna need to start right there. Let's start there. Uh, there is a question. And so uh, Maria, I see your question about ADHD. Uh, that is, um, my training uh, with regards as far as mental health, I don't have a doctor, but I, I did go to graduate school, got a, a master's in counseling. So, and I worked with uh, children and adolescents. So we're gonna talk about ADHD and how to uh, work around medication because I was more on the counseling side. So I didn't, I didn't prescribe medication. So there is a way, uh, it, it does require work on your, on your part, uh, but there is a way to, to uh, have your child be relatively stable without medication. So we'll, we'll talk about that later on. But let's start with cancer, uh, since we see the there's a lot of question marks popping up in the comment section. So let's start with cancer and triple negative breast cancer. Okay, so I think everybody needs to know, first and foremost, that cancer is not one disease. When you hear that word cancer, it, cancer is a disease that can affect almost any organ. It can affect any organ in the body. But when we talk about breast cancer, the breast is made up of two main parts, right? The, the ducts that carry the milk and the lobules that make the milk. And the way we characterize or classify breast cancers is by whether or not hormones are making it grow. Hormones like estrogen, right? So estrogen uh, makes our menstrual cycles. It makes our uterine lining get thick as we get ready for pregnancy. Progesterone is another female hormone that makes our bodies do stuff, right? There's a third receptor on a cancer cell. So cancer cells, when we look under the microscope, we're looking at these cells and they're tinier than grains of salt or sugar. And we're looking to see if they have these three main receptors on them, on their surfaces. They're like toll booths on the turnpike. We're looking for three toll booths because if you got a toll booth, we know you're using the dollar and the dollar is estrogen. So estrogen, you pay your dollar, it makes new cancer cells grow. People who don't have those toll booths, are in the easy pass lane. I mean, you know, like in Pennsylvania, the easy pass lane means express lane. You're going right through. You're not stopping through the tolls. You're zooming right through. It means it's faster. It's more aggressive. It means we don't know what's driving it. So triple negative breast cancer is a very aggressive form of breast cancer that more often affects black women. It more often affects young women. It more often affects people who uh, have BRCA mutations or the mutations in breast cancer genes. And that type of cancer doesn't have a pill to prevent recurrence. And the treatments are more often than not chemotherapy because we just don't know what's driving it to grow. There's no good targets for therapy. So we gotta get the most aggressive or the harshest therapy because it's the most aggressive type of cancer. So that's what triple negative breast cancer day, excuse me, that's what triple negative breast cancer is. Triple negative breast cancer day is Thursday and you should be posting about it. Ask your family and friends, do you know what triple negative breast cancer is? Because it is deadly and it's important to diagnose it early. So it's a type of breast cancer where you gotta get chemotherapy because there's no targeted therapies. There's no pills available for it. And if I could just add another thing, we understand that uh, black people are typically delayed in terms of seeing seeing a doctor. Uh, we're not as good as getting those checks, those, those uh, mammograms that we should be getting, wh whether it's a, a, a sonogram, whatever we should be getting, we typically delay. That delay can be deadly. So understanding that you should need to get your regular checkups uh, and understand also that there is, there's been some studies about the, the breast density mm -hmm. for black women. So we just understand. We can definitely talk about it, right? So right. breast density is the thickness of the breast tissue. And mm -hmm. again, with the analogies, I talk to people in terms that's easy to understand. If you're old like I am, you remember console TVs. Remember big floor model, <laughs> my grandmother had a console TV. That's and right. When it broke, right? And it had the static on it and we had the bunny ears and you had to sometimes add foil to it and you had to hold it just so. And then when it broke, you went and put another TV on top of it and became furniture. Right. 
Well, the static or the snow on the screen is like the density of the breast on your mammogram or your x-ray. And the more density you have, the more static you have, the harder it is to see the picture. So you can't tell if it's Phil Donahue or Sally Jesse Raphael or Murder, <laughs> She Wrote or People's Court. Yeah, I'm going back, right? All you the way back. See the <laughs> and it's the same thing for breast density. The more density you have, the harder it is to see if you have cancer hiding in your breast. Black women have on average 30% higher density our breasts are thicker and that means it's harder to see if the cancers are there and therefore we might be eligible based on our density for additional screening because what determines whether or not you should get a mammogram or mammogram and an ultrasound or an mri is your family history your breast density and some other risk factors so you should know when you get that letter it says the sensitivity of mammography for heterogeneously dense or greater breasts is diminished that means the thicker your breast is the harder it is to see and they're going to tell you what category of density you are and if your category c or d or 50 to 75 percent or more than 75 percent you should probably get at least an ultrasound along with your mammogram right so Check for your own lumps. You should be checking, doing your self checks. Get that mammogram. If if that mammogram comes back and says it's, you have a thicker density, go for the ultrasound, go for the MRI. Express get... your doctor about it too. Yes. Because your doctor may not say anything. They get that same letter you have and they don't know what to do with it either because the guidelines are new and being updated. And so if you get that letter and it says you're heterogeneously dense or greater breasts, you talk to your primary and say, listen, it says my breasts are very dense. I should get an ultrasound. Can I have an ultrasound? Can you order that? And, and they should order that. Yeah. So here's a question from Veronica. She says, what age should you stop having mammograms? And she says she heard after 70. You know, I, I think 70 is probably the new 55. When you think about, right, think about the Golden Girls. Remember that old show, The Golden Girls? They were like in their 50s, late 50s, early 60s. And you think about like Jennifer Lopez did a movie called, you know, Hustler. She's swinging on a pole. She's 51 years old, right? Mm -hmm. Janet Jackson had a baby at like 51. So 70 is not really a good end point. The age is not. So you should stop getting mammograms when your life expectancy is less than 10 years. So if you're 90 years old and still wearing lipstick and still driving, guess what? You should be getting a mammogram. You know, mm. if you have a lot of chronic conditions and your mobility is not so great and you're at the point where you wouldn't do anything about it if they found something, then you might talk to your doctor about not getting screened as much. I personally think everybody should get it every year because if you start skipping years, like some of the guidelines say when you hit 55, you should go every other year. No, you shouldn't. The number one and two risk factor for breast cancer is being a woman and getting older. Mm -hmm. God willing, we'll keep doing both, right? So you <laughs> should be getting it every year until you're at the point where you're not going to do anything about it. So, But the guidelines say life expectancy less than 10 years. Well, if you're just joining us, we're, you, this is What to Know from Dr. Mo. This show is designed about answering your questions. Right now, we're talking about cancer because it's triple negative breast cancer day on Thursday. So you should be posting about it. Get the hashtag. Share this amongst Black people because Black women are, are disproportionately impacted by this type of breast cancer. It's aggressive. It hits you younger and it's more deadly. So we need to know about this. And there's some there's some basically physical differences that black women have inherently that could prevent this cancer being detected earlier. And the, the longer it takes to, for cancer to be detected, the more it has a chance to grow. And, and that's the more, you know, deadly it becomes, right? And so we you, you know, Ellis, there's, there's not just physical things, right? There's a whole molecular side to this regarding why some cancers are more aggressive. You know, black women die at three times the rate, four times the rate, and we're diagnosed at three times the rate. We're mm -hmm. diagnosed younger, higher recurrence. There's something going on on the science side of things that's not just, oh, black women are obese and we didn't breastfeed and, you know, we're less likely to get screened early. Those are those are factors potentially, right? We know socioeconomics and access to care is an issue, but right. there is a science that has largely been ignored also. And so one of the things I love about the organization, you know, that I'm a medical director of Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance, is that we're putting money and efforts into the actual research, right? So do the right. drugs work for us? Are there interventions besides drugs? Are there genes involved for black people that we just didn't know about before because we, we weren't in those clinical trials? 
And so there's a lot more that we can know, but it just starts with basic awareness, like what age to start getting a mammogram? What's your family history? What's your breast density? Do you have any other risk factors? Those are Mm -hmm. four questions that you can learn the answers to tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow. You know, we should all be knowing those things. So we're talking about cancer. You you sent over a great graphic to kind of talk about how cancers are formed. I'm going to pull this graphic up here. These are the kind of the genetic uh, changes. What causes genetic changes? And it's those genetic changes that are the kind of the impetus to us developing cancer in some form, not just breast cancer, but all types of cancers. And so these are some of the major factors. So let's kind of break down and, and see what how these factors impact our body and our bodies, you know, changing to, to develop in cancer cells. Absolutely. You know, NIH did a survey in 2019 and 69% of the population think that just about everything causes cancer, right? <laughs> that was the question. Do you believe that everything causes cancer? You strongly disagree. You disagree, strongly yeah. agree, agree. And 69% of the American population say, yeah, pretty much everything causes cancer. There it is, right? <laughs> right. And, and so we have to talk about like what actually causes cancer. And so the answer is cancer is caused by cellular damage. What damages cells? Well, pretty much everything. And so you're not <laughs> wrong in that you could drink hot tea or hot coffee and it would damage the cells in your lining of your esophagus and your stomach and your colon just based on drinking hot beverages. But our bodies have an ability to heal themselves. So what causes the genetic changes that contribute to cancer? And you gotta understand it like this. All cancer is genetic, meaning these cells have figured out how to live forever. They're supposed to die at a certain age, just like people. But imagine Mm -hmm. if you didn't, right? Imagine if you figured out how to actually live forever, and then you figured out how to have offspring and divide forever. That's what a cancer cell is. And there's certain things that can contribute to that. And the biggest risk factor for, uh, let's say it this way, not the biggest, but the highest level of risk for cancers is heredity. So while all cancer is genetic, not all cancer is hereditary. What do I mean by that? Genetic means the cells made changes in their blueprint so that they can learn how to live forever and not die. Hereditary means it's passed down generation after generation after generation, right? So only five to 10% of all cancers, I'd say 10%, we're learning maybe up to 12 are because of hereditary mutations, meaning you inherited that change from your family members. I'll give you an example. Last year, we interviewed uh, Matthew Knowles, Beyonce's father. Mm -hmm. He has a mutation in the BRCA2 gene, the the breast cancer associated gene. It's a gatekeeper gene, meaning if that gatekeeper or that spell checker, if it goes faulty, then guess what happens? You start letting mistakes through, right? If you got a faulty spell checker, pretty soon your term paper is going to be full of mistakes and those mistakes lead to cancer. So if his daughters inherited that mutation, they have a now up to 86% chance of getting breast cancer in their lifetime up to age 80. And so that's why I say it's the highest level of risk because even people like me with family history, mom with cancer, grandmother with certain cancers, I'm higher risk, but I'm not 86% lifetime risk. So heredity changes in the gatekeeper genes that are from familially passed down, that are passed down through families, have the highest level of cancer risk, okay? Let's talk about viruses. Well, I bet you can name one virus that's associated with cancer. What do you think? HPV. Bingo, bango. Anybody in the (laughs) chat got it? Let me see. How they say bazinga, right? HPV, human papillomavirus, is associated with cervical cancer, associated with anal cancer, associated with throat, head and neck cancers, esophageal cancers, right? So the HPV virus is associated with cancers and how? Well, because viruses get into cells and they change the machinery. They go in there and they rewire stuff. The next thing you know, all the wires are haywire and these cells have figured out how to evade the usual death mechanism. They figure out how to live forever and how to reproduce and make more of themselves. And the virus teaches those cells how to do that in certain locations. So viruses are absolutely associated with certain cancers. HIV viruses associated with certain cancers. Um, you know, uh, uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, for example. Mm-hmm. There are other viruses that we're learning are related to uh, cancers, like stomach gastric cancers. 
So, yep, we got to watch for the viruses. Somebody said in the chat, your body can fight HPV. Well, there are different, there's so many different strains of HPV. Some strains are more aggressive than others. Some are responsible for the warts you get on your feet, you know, those little ingrown uh, warts, the plantar warts, right? That's an HPV virus. Some are associated with warts in your genitalia. That's a different strain of HPV. Some are associated with, you know, throat infections like Epstein-Barr, Epstein-Barr. That's a different HPV. So there's lots of different ones, but in general, our body has a mechanism to fight lots of different things. So it's whether or not- And there's a vaccine, isn't there? There's a vaccine for, yes. And, okay. and there aren't that many vaccines. You know, it's a mixed bag on black folks and vaccines, and we know why. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? Let's call right. a thing a thing. Right. But there are not very many vaccines that can help to prevent a cancer. And when I hear something like that, we need to be listening. We need to listen up because if a virus, if a cancer can be preventable by preventing a viral infection, it's something that we should be thinking about and researching and really looking into. And, you know, I know it's, it's required in a lot of places. Um, and, and, and like I said, folks have different opinions about it, but you do your research, ask your doctors, ask the questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And we're very quick to dispel a thing. Like we love to be contrarians. We love to say, you know what, if this is what doctors <laughs> are saying, then we choose the exact opposite. But you do your research. You know, because what you'll find is that, you know, beyond Dr. Google, you'll find the publications, the studies, the trials, and you'll get a chance to see how much of this is really real or not. But there is a vaccine that prevents a virus that causes cancer, and that's important for our community because when we get cancer, we get it worse. Can I add one thing on the whole do your research piece? Mm -hmm. Um, Research is not talking to a friend, okay? And let's not... Let's not, and research is a preponderance of evidence. And what I mean is like, where is the most evidence, right? So we can't identify one or two like exceptions to the mountain of evidence that are pointing in one direction. And then we find one or two exceptions and say, well, that research is bunk. No, there's no absolutes, right? As well in research. So yeah, you might have a friend or you might know this person or they said or who, whatever that is not going to supersede the mountain of evidence that's pointing in one direction. So when you're doing your research, understanding that if research has been done on a thousand people and you've got two cases where that doesn't fit the, what the thousand people have found, that's not a way to negate the research. That just says, okay, look, that, because the research has that built in. It's not a hundred percent, even with the, the effect of this, of this coronavirus, this, this COVID-19 vaccine. At one point, it was 95, 98%, but there's still room for it not to be effective. Mm -hmm. But more people have had positive results than negative. And so just understanding and just keep that in mind when you're doing your research. Absolutely. And, you know, look at the different cohorts and and the different, um, how do I say it? Even if, let's say you're looking up breast cancer, you have to be specific in what you look up or you'll get information that is not specific to what you have. And so when I diagnose a woman with breast cancer, I tell her, this is the type of cancer you have. You have invasive ductal carcinoma. Your cancer broke out of the milk ducts, right? But your subtype is ER positive, PR positive, whatever that thing is, because it's like saying, I'm a woman with red hair. I'm a woman with brown eyes. If you just type in, I'm a woman, you get all the women. And you have to be specific. So in your research, you have to look at the studies to know, is this study relevant to you? Were there black people in this study? Were there young people in this study? Were there, who was in it, right? And so we have to be really discerning. And that's why I I encourage people, if you read something and you have questions, bring it to your trusted advisors, bring it to doctors that you trust. And don't be afraid to, to question it and do that sort of investigation. But it's more than a Google search. It's more than a Facebook search. It's more than just listening to what somebody told you. You really, you know, there's a way to do research for a lay person so that you can know what resources are trusted and what stuff is, is the BS that comes up high on the queue because they pay more money to come up higher in the search engine. People pay Say that. more money to come up <laughs> high in the search engine and you click on the first thing you find and you think it's because it's the most reliable. No, they just pay the most money to yep. get up to the top. Google is a business, remember that. All right, okay. so we, we talked about hereditary, uh, hereditary, we talked about viruses. All right, what else are those things that cause genetic changes? 
So UV radiation, UV radiation can come from lots of places. It comes from the sun, microwaves, airports. It comes from anywhere where there is ionizing radiation that can contribute to damage to cells. Now the disclaimer for radiation is this. People say, well, mammograms are radiation, therefore mammograms cause cancer. And the answer is, while mammograms do utilize radiation, the risk of radiation exposure, the amount of exposure of a mammogram is equivalent to about three to four months of walking around radiation, just daily sun, airports, microwaves, et cetera. And the benefit outweighs the risk. The benefit of finding a cancer early outweighs the risk of everyday radiation for three, four months that you would get anyway. And so you should mm. not look at your mammograms as a source of significant damage causing radiation. It's more on the, diagnostic side of things. And there is actually a benefit to some radiation. We use radiation therapeutically for certain cancers, after breast cancer, you know, lung cancers, colon cancers, radiation has benefit as much mm -hmm. as it has damage, but radiation can cause cell damage and cell damage causes cancer. Yep. Chemicals. There's a whole list of chemicals. I have to put this article in the chat. I found an article that had 116 different carcinogens that they had listed them all, all the different chemicals that you would want to know about because it, it's important information to know that, you know, some of the plastics and, and some of the, um, some of the hairsprays, some of the products that we use every day can cause cancer. So yeah, car, you know, there's there's all sorts of exposures from that perspective as well, and people should be aware of the chemicals that you can control, right? So maybe not taking in nitrates and smoked and processed meat, smoked bacon, sauces, smoked oysters, you know, looking at your hairsprays and that your chemicals that you put onto your body, your cosmetics and things like that. There's some control that you have, but don't go down a rabbit hole. Because if you go down a rabbit hole, you won't use anything. You won't yes. eat out of anything. You won't drink out of anything. And we can't control this. Where I am, they mine uranium in 1910, and there's a nuclear power plant 20 miles over. What are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, and I'm glad you say don't go down a rabbit hole because you absolutely can go can, can go nuts, if you, especially if you start reading labels of food packets and things that you're eating, what's in there, what you're putting in your body. Uh, so the, the safest bet is this. Um, when you're eating, try to eat as fresh as possible. Try to eat as natural as possible, right? The more processed the food is, the more carcinogens it could potentially ha contain, right? So if, you know, we know they make, you know, those... Uh, lunch meats out of meat, right? Let's go with the more, the less processed meat, right? Because they add a lot of stuff in order to create those lunch meats. So yes, let's eat it as natural as possible. Fresh fruits and vegetables versus cans and other things like that. So the more processed something has, the more likely, and then especially like all those fried, we're talking about fried with, with oils and things like that. Those things definitely trans fats, things of that, they tend, they cause other health problems and they can also cause, cause cancer. You know, we love some barbecue, black folks. You know, we love it. Okay. So I'm just going to speak to y'all cousins. Right. I, I, I'm they, I'm we, I, okay. I, I'm in there. It's true. Those, when that, that char, that black char that is on the barbecue is, can, can cause cancer. It gets into your, it gets into your gut and it hurts my feelings. Cause I, I gotta, I love the grill, right? I love to cook out. But you got to do it in moderation. You can't just do it all the time. And, and definitely don't cook your food to that point where it's got that black char on it. Scrape it off the grill. Don't cook your food that much because at that point in time, that could get into your gut and cause some some, some cancer. So just got to be careful. Eat, eat healthy, eat natural, and eat as natural as possible and, and get food in as, as much as its natural state as possible. Yeah. And, and be really careful about things like protein supplements and stuff, because I know that, you know, we want to be healthy, right? We want to get our protein. We want to bulk up. We want to, you know, do certain things. But some of those protein supplements have growth hormones in them, you know, mm -hmm. things like Slim Jims and, you know, that sort of smoked yeah. meat. That stuff's yeah. got it's ton of sodium, but it's the nitrates that cause cancer. Those nitrates get into the cells and they wreak havoc, you know, and the more of, of the types of foods that, you know, cause cancer and we could do a whole talk you really might want to get the doctor the two dr moe's on and we could talk about <laughs> foods that cause cancer and foods that help prevent cancer i say you do a crossover show yes but, 
you you've got to be careful because also those things don't promote good gut health right it sits in your right. colon and when it sits in your colon it gets converted to bacteria and that bacteria gets through the colon wall and this speaks to our colon cancer awareness month right mm -hmm. because the bacteria from food that sits there this is why it's important to poop if you're not pooping every day and we're just going to be real candid move your bowels mm -hmm. if they are not moving at least once a day possibly more it's not necessarily normal even though some people say it's my normal for your bowels to move once a week too much bacteria sits in your colon. And so you've got to find a way to make your stools bulkier, fluffier, more water, more fiber, because the bacteria gets into the bloodstream and it goes places and causes little nests of DNA damage. And those cells start dividing. We can move over to that next little bubble there, mm -hmm. right? And so all the blood vessels go to those areas and, you know, causes cells to be abnormal. It gives it more food, more nutrients, more oxygen to places that are already damaged. And that's a problem. Smoking, the last one on the list, smoking causes cancer, not just in the lungs. Right. Smoking is a risk factor for breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer, you name it, liver cancer, pretty much every cancer there is. Smoking is a risk factor for, because of one, the nicotine and the carcinogen there, but two, the, the pollutants and the chemicals that are combined to make a cigarette. It's not to say that vaping is any better. Vaping is not because you're inhaling things that irritate and cause inflammation in the lining of your lungs. But smoking pretty much anything is not great. There are studies that are looking at, you know, THC and marijuana, but it's the, 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 the fact of inhaling smoke as an irritant that yeah. creates inflammation, that creates cell damage, that contributes to these things. So, you know, even though it's something that people say is natural, it's from the earth, it has therapeutic benefits. I'm not disputing the therapeutic benefits of something like a marijuana plant, but how you take it in can impact how therapeutic it is in the long run and the damage that it does to your cells. You heard it right here. You heard it here first. So here's a question that, that came from Maria. Is it good to get a colon cleanse? So I think that um, it's important to, to move stuff out of your colon. I think that when you do a colon cleanse, it, you have to be careful of a couple things. So I'm not going to weigh on how good it is because I think that it can be therapeutic. And there are studies that show that although the Western doctors don't like to admit the benefits of something like a colon cleanse, even though we make people do it to get their colonoscopies, right? Mm -hmm. The worry and the concern is this. When you do a colon cleanse, one, it is usually osmotic, meaning it's a lot of salt and a lot of sugar and a lot of magnesium that draws all the water into your bowels so that the poop can move through. It makes it watery, right? So you can clean it out. When you do that, you dehydrate the body. And so you have to be very careful that you don't get dehydrated doing a colon cleanse because you know drinking substances, doing these detoxes helps to move things through, but at the expense of robbing your body of water elsewhere. So you gotta make sure that you don't lose your, your electrolytes and your water because that can cause cell damage and cause brain damage. The other part of it is that there is good bacteria in the gut, right? We take mm -hmm. these probiotics and we eat yogurt and we take, you know, the, the different good bacteria because they help to get rid of the damaged cells in our colon. They help to promote the good bacteria, which breaks down the stool. And if you colon cleanse too much, you will get rid of the good bacteria that's in your gut. If you take too many antibiotics, you will get rid of the good bacteria in your gut and then mm -hmm. you end up with an overgrowth of the bad bacteria. You end up with infections like C. diff, which is a watery, nasty smelling stool where there's too much bad bacteria because the balance is off. Just like our, you know, our lady parts down below, the pH balance matters, right? It matters right. in our colons too. So while a colon cleanse is not necessarily a bad thing, you've got to be careful that you don't do it too often and wipe out the good gut bacteria and make sure that you don't lose all your electrolytes and dehydrate yourself because that makes your kidneys fail. It can cause brain damage. Dehydration is just bad for you all around. Okay, so if you're just joining us, I'm doing a quick reset. If you're just joining us, this is What to Know with Dr. Mo, and we are answering your questions. We just did a whole kind of TED Talk on cancer and what causes cancer and people's beliefs about cancer, and we talked about triple negative breast cancer as well, and then we kind of led that to the broader 
over all cancer discussion. So there was a question early, early, early in the program about a child with ADHD. So I'm going to address that real quick because the show is all about your answering your questions. So Maria, I, I see you're still with us. So I'm going to answer your question. Is there a natural way to help kids with ADHD without medication? Yes. The short answer is yes, there is a way. Um, but but there's also that it depends on the type of ADHD, right? And so because there's there's different types. Is it primarily in, uh, inattentive? Is it primarily hyperactive? And so you have to kind of determine what the subtype of ADHD is because ADHD, for those who don't know, it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's commonly uh, diagnosed uh, early in children. And then there's a whole bunch of medications uh, and, and that are prescribed for it, uh, Stratera being one of them, and there's a few others that are, that are out there. Um, Ritalin, I think that's another one that that that's very very popular. Uh, the irony of these Adderall, there's an, there's the irony of these medications are is that they are stimulants, right? And so uh, if you don't have ADHD. Um, people have abused those medications and use them uh, as stimulants to, to stay awake and all other kind of things. So for a child that's hyperactive, and so uh, thank you for, for giving that subtype there, Maria. So for a child that's hyperactive, uh, physical activity, right? So uh, what I've, parents that I've talked to that have not used medications, they use a lot of physical activity. Sports uh, are very, very easy uh, to, to get involved with, uh, to get your child involved with because that burns off a lot of that energy. They have a lot of energy. So, but that's hard in school, right? And so that's where your what that's where your challenges will come with because school, especially public school, has a tendency to have larger classrooms and they value order. People sitting at their desk doing their work. <laughs> and so natural foods, yes. You got to really cut down on the sugar, right? You should be cutting down on your child's sugar intake anyway, right? But you're going to have to be very, very significant and very, very intentional. There's, there's that word that I love. Intentional in terms of limiting your child's sugar. They will adjust. So if you've already started giving them sugar and they, they start rejecting things that aren't sweet, guess what? You keep giving it to them. It's like drinking water. Like you may not like the taste of water, but you keep drinking it. Eventually, you're going to get used to it, right? If you keep giving them food that's not high in sugar, eventually they're, they're going to get used to it. They're going to have to because they're going to get hungry. Because my mama always tell me when, when she would cook something that I didn't like, she said, hungry people eat. <laughs> right? And so you can sit there. You'll get hungry enough. You'll eat this food. Right? Right. <laughs> and so that's, you know, so high rates of physical activity really helps. It helps a lot more in the summertime activities that they enjoy. Uh, in school, you can work with the school counselor and say, my child has been diagnosed with this. They're not on medications, but you can work out a program with a school counselor that gives them breaks throughout the day to where they can burn off some energy so they can be in the classroom. You have to be very, so I'm going to stress this point though, have to be careful. You don't want your child labeled with special ed because that puts them in a whole different category, right? So you work with your counselor and, and don't get them that, get them those labels. Cause when they get those labels, that's when they really, they put, it sets them on a different path academically. And so we have to make sure that we're, you're cognizant of that. Let me jump in and say um, a couple things. One on the, on the food and nutrition and things you can do side of things. I think something like 70% of, of youth with ADHD were found to have magnesium deficiencies. Okay. Um, so we know that magnesium, B6, um, uh, omega fatty acids, like there mm -hmm. are foods that you can supplement to augment your brain, right? So, so those brain foods, those good nuts, good fatty acids, um, uh, magnesium supplements, vitamin B complex, zinc, um, those are all linked to better brain health and they can be supplements that you can, you know, consider giving to your child, but you get more of it through the food that you eat than through right. a pill that you take. The second thing I'd like to say is, is that, you know, I got diagnosed with, uh, and, and girls don't always present with hyperactivity. So your right. girls may have attention deficit, but they may not have the H, the hyperactivity side of things. Right. And it presents like boredom in school. It presents like they're spacing out. It presents like they're disinterested. Um, you know, their attention span is short and that needs to be addressed. You know, I don't think my grandmother knew when she raised me that I had this issue, but what she did was she gave me piano lessons and she took mm -hmm. something that I loved and it taught me how to focus because I loved music. 
And by learning music, and I'd sit there at that piano and I'd turn the radio on because I used to watch one of my aunts do this. She'd turn the radio on and she'd plink, 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 plink. Next thing I know, she could play anything, anything on the radio. And I used to try to be her and I would sit there and turn that radio on and I learned to focus through piano lessons. So finding mm -hmm. what turns your child's brain on and putting them in that thing is a great way to address it. Um, and I think that the third thing is, you know, having a diagnosis is important. Having the label in school is not important, but you know, you've got to know what it is so you know how to address it. Right. Because I didn't find out until I was about 30 years old that I had a, a, a processing disorder. I had attention deficit disorder because I was taking the American Board of Surgery and I was struggling with it. And I had gotten through mm -hmm. college, graduate school, medical school, residency, fellowship at Georgetown. <laughs> I presented research in Scotland. I had an eight page CV and the guy said, wow, have you ever finished an exam? And I said, I don't think I finished a test. I always run out of time. And I just thought I was lucky to be here and had to study twice as hard. And he said, well, the way your brain works, you, you need to go back to information the way you learned it. He said, I gave you a list of 25 things to remember. And every hour for seven hours, I've asked you to remember the whole list and nobody ever remembers all of it. He said, but you did but you had to go back to number one, number two, number three, and I gave you all kinds of shortcuts in between and ways to group them so your brain would take these shortcuts and your brain doesn't take shortcuts. Nope. And so I, I say that to say that if your child does have attention deficit disorder, it doesn't mean that they can't be what they want, they can't do what they want, that they cannot have great successes in life because I'm living proof that they can. But figuring out what it is, what they need, and getting their brains tuned into something is super, super, important more important than medication even and medication helps some people sometimes for me it made me really jittery and i had to get off of medication but i started out on it so that i could understand how i would feel and how it would affect me but if the kid has it it's okay it really is they can be whatever they want to be and that brings a good point so when i was in uh when i was in grad school i read this wonderful book and it talked about this book talked about the positives Right of ADHD because I had that same mind, Doc. So I, I realized I was self-diagnosed because I was trying to figure out like why can't I just stay focused? Like and, and I was really, really active, very bright, but just active and my mind is going. In. So here's some beautiful things that, that are about the ADHD mind is the ability to multitask is phenomenal in the ADHD mind. We can pick up everything that's going on in the room, right? Because we love stimulus, right? That brain, a lot of that ADHD brain craves stimulus, right? So we're looking, so that's why that kid, we can see everything that's happening in the room, pick up on it, and it's so much fun. And it's like, it's like food for the brain, right? And so, but that I'm creates- I'm managing two chats at once. I'm going to say, look at the and right. my brain is getting it all. And it's it's so awesome. You're right. And you, yeah, so you can definitely multitask. So that's a beautiful thing. When we're interested in something, we also have the ability to hyper-focus. And so that's what Dr. Mo is talking about. When we do hyper-focus, we catch. So we have the ability to catch everything, and then we, we can hyper-focus. So when you find those activities that your child is really engaged in, have the find what they connect to, like Dr. Mo talked about the piano, and then try to apply that learning type and style to other things and teach them other things that they can get involved in. Find that piece of the learning. I just, I was a kid that loved science and loved learning, didn't like tests, right? Could do them, right? And I always tested well, whatever that means. But I just hate it because I, I, I was like, this is not a real assessment of what I've, what I know. Right. This is a snapshot. Right. Almost like a biopsy. But that's a whole other, <laughs> a whole other subject. But but I was like, let's talk about, you know, what, what we do. So I love the, the gathering of the knowledge. So find those things that your child really can engage in. Burn off that energy if they're hyperactive. Find a way to burn off the energy. Give them the give them constructive build ways to get them to burn off that energy, even if it's just running around in the yard in the circle, let them do it, right? Because they, if the, when they can burn that off and they give them ways to where they can focus that mind and then they can settle and, and be laser focused on whatever you need for them to do that evening, right? The last and, and thing the, I'll say is teach mindfulness. You know, we think that mindfulness is something for adults, right? Yoga and meditation is something that adults do because they're stressed out and it's finally we get to this point in life where we start to see some value in in meditation somewhere in our probably usually in our 40s although i will say people in their 30s and 20s are really finding benefit in it but there yep. is great benefit there are studies that show when young people in elementary school when kindergartners meditate 
when yes. they sit still and either think about one thing or are given something to do like count down, count backwards from 10 really slowly or imagine these clouds. When, they, when we teach mindfulness to kids, they perform better in school mm -hmm. as far as their behavior. They perform better on exams. They're able to focus and their concentration is better. And so it, it's important to start those techniques early for your kids. And it's not just something for adults, but you know, kindergartners can do yoga. They, and, and, and we should do they it can. together as families, absolutely. And yes, to the person who asked that question, can you have it as adult and never be diagnosed? Absolutely can. And it usually <laughs> manifests. And like I just told my story, I got diagnosed as an adult at 30, 30 something years old, 35 years old. I think I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. And it manifested as I was trying to get through a certain milestone in life. And I wasn't able to meet the challenge because my brain processed things in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself challenged. I would go to my therapist and my therapist said, I think you need to see a neuropsychiatrist or a neuropsychologist. I think you need to see a neuropsychologist. And I said, a neuropsychologist? She said, yeah. She said, because the way you're describing your thoughts and your energy, the way your energy fluctuates could be symptomatic of a couple things. It could be bipolar where you feel really up and really creative. And then you have moments where you're not so uh we call it manic right you're really right. productive in the right. manic phase but then in the down phase you're not able to really function or get anything done or you might have attention deficit disorder or processing disorder that makes you able to focus in really well for a few minutes but you can't quite finish projects and get things done and so if you find that that's you one minute you're vacuuming the next minute the stove is on and you're baking muffins and then you're ironing and the radio and the cabinets are all left open and you know yep. you might you know yeah. So yeah, yeah, I got diagnosed in grad school and it was one of those things. It was like, and, and I and I found, especially when I got to college, there was so much to do, right? So my mind was like, I'm sitting in this classroom, but there's everything was going out. It was an area called the set in college and everybody, there was so much energy out there, right? And so much brain stimulus. And I'm sitting in this accounting class. It was driving me nuts, right? And so I was like, you know, so you have to really know what is driving your behaviors what is driving that 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 brain right it's like yeah i love learning but it, the stimulus was so addictive right and so you have to make it make sure that you understand how you work and how your child works and the more you more understanding you can get the better you can help them uh survive and, and thrive without uh medication um you know, Alex, I'm just going to jump in here and say that the set, our attentions were no match for the set. You know, if you went to Florida a and University, I don't care how much focus you had. If it was a step show, a probate going on, if it was, you know, no, certain times a day, <laughs> forget about it. Our brains were gone. We were all on the set. And the professors knew, though. They knew. They were like, yeah, it's homecoming Friday. It's not, it's not going to happen. Like, just uh, don't, don't go with it. But yeah, this is... Yeah, ADHD is is really, it's near and dear, and and I'm glad. So, Dr. Dr. Mo put some great, um, you know, answer question about broccoli. She talked about some foods. Really, you have to you have to go back to school and learn. If you don't want your child to be on medication, you're gonna have to put in the work, and that's really what it boils down to. It, it because it can't medication does help, uh, and they might eventually need some help, some medication when they go to school, but you can take them off in their home, right? So you can work out, a, work with your your child's psychiatrist if they're seeing a child psychiatrist. Work with them, develop a plan that you feel comfortable with. And they might start on medication, and then you can start putting these other plans that we talked about tonight in place. Mm -hmm. And then as they start taking more and more shape with your child, you can start weaning them off the medication. So there, there's a way, there's ways to do it that's healthy, but make sure you're working with your healthcare provider. I want to put in a plug here for medication because I know that somebody just said they don't like it when the doctors try to label the children and push medication. Yeah. And I don't like that either. I didn't like it as a child and I don't like it um, from the sense of the label being the thing that now determines your child's aptitude, right? right? Like that's a problem. However, on the subject of medication, medications were designed to be the concentrated versions of naturally occurring substances right so mm -hmm. if you have a headache you don't need to take you know three weeks of the powder that's in aspirin or the plant that is aspirin in order to get rid of your headache they have taken it processed refined it and put it into a capsule so your headache can be gone in hours 
right? And so these are, and I say that to say that medications, we as a community should view them more as a bridge to wellness than we do. We view medication, some of us, as a quick fix. Like, we don't want to take the long road. Give me the, give me the pill. Give me the, especially weight loss, right? Give me the pill. Mm-hmm. People who hate medication, give me the pill. But the other part of it is that it can be a bridge to wellness. So diabetes, for example, just because you're mm-hmm. on metformin, just because you're on insulin, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stay on that. Use it as a bridge to wellness. As you right. work on your exercise and your diet and you work on getting that A1C down, the medication helps keep you from having the long-term side effects of diabetes, destroying your pancreas, your blood vessels, your eyes, the neuropathy, the nerves, right? So the medication can be a bridge to wellness hypertension, right? You got high blood pressure. Yeah, you can get that down naturally, but your anti-hypertension is going to keep you from stroking out while you're out there running and while you are getting your fitness revolution going. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's important to look at medication in a different way than we do because there can be helpful benefits of it as we enact our plan that can ultimately get you off of those medications. And yeah, every medication almost has a side effect. You look at those commercials, (laughs) it's terrifying some of them. And let that be the motivation for you to be able to come off of those, especially things like antidepressants, because as a community, we don't like to talk about depression. But Mm. our mind impacts our wellness, right? When we are not of sound mind, meaning we are anxious, depressed, stressed out, our cortisol levels are high, the stress genes are turned on, we're not sleeping well, and all of that leads to dysregulation of your body. When your body is not resting well, when your body is in distress, that is how disease happens. And sometimes we need medications in order to regulate the hormones that influence our mood. And even those medications, like I tell some of my cancer patients, it's okay if during the winter time, you gotta go on an antidepressant, let's use it as a bridge to get you to spring when the days are gonna be longer, right? Because we can, we can get through our seasonal effective period when it's dark at two o'clock in the afternoon and everybody doesn't feel like doing things like exercise and you feel mad because you mm-hmm. got cancer and you feel tired and you feel sluggish and you're cold, right? Medicine can be a bridge to get you to wellness. Same thing for antidepressants and our community especially needs to look at that in a different way and start to view medicines as an adjunct, not as an alternative. It's not either or. You can have CMOS and you can have an antihypertensive. You can have a meditation and a spiritual practice and an antidepressant. And then mm-hmm. you decide for yourself how to get your, with your healthcare provider, how to get yourself to whatever wellness looks like for you. So I'd want to ask a question, can ADHD lead to other mental illnesses as the child becomes an adult? I will say it can, um, and, and, but the caveat for me would be, and, and doc, uh, the caveat for me would be, if the ADHD is causing some significant impairment in social and occupational functioning, right? And that can cause isolation. And then when we get isolated, then that can lead to depression or some anxiety. Right. Because now we're isolated because we can't function. We can't function on a job. We, we, we have meltdowns or whatever, whatever that ADHD is impairing in terms of our ability to to function within society as a norm. And that pushes us out to isolation. And then that isolation can lead to other me- mental illnesses. So, yes, it can. Uh, if we don't get a handle on being able to manage our ADHD, that doesn't impair our ability to function. I I will absolutely agree with that, you know, and I think somebody else put a really good comment and sometimes, you know, when you are doing well, the doctor doesn't want to to lower the dose or take you off of it. And I think the other part of that is that sometimes you're doing well because of what you're on and to take you off of it will disrupt your apple cart. And a prime example are things like schizophrenia, right? Mm. Sometimes some medications are for life. (laughs) And you are doing well, you know, bipolar depression. There's ways to get yourself off safely, I think. And I won't say get yourself off because it really has to be done with your with your doctors. But the reason why people like to come off a certain medicine is because they take it and they feel better. They take their antidepressant. They're like, great, I feel better. I want to stop taking this. But you feel better because of your antidepressant. Yeah. And so you have to wean <laughs> off of it really, really right. slowly in ways that makes you feel like your doctor may not be partnering with you. And it's a really good conversation to have 
with your doctor because the medicine is working, which is why you feel better. It's why you're stable. It's why your levels are what they are. Let's say your blood pressure. So you yep. really have to prove that your blood pressure is going to maintain where it needs to be off of medication. And that takes more than just you take the pills for two weeks and get your blood pressure down, your blood pressure down because of the pills. If you come off of it, your blood pressure will still be high until your diet and lifestyle changes kick in. So I would say that's where those good conversations happen. And it's okay to challenge your doctor and, you know, let them give their perspective. You give yours and then test those theories out. Say, all right, doc, let's test it out. And then if you do well, your doctor's test and say, okay, we're going to cut this dose down, you know? And, and so your doctor should be partnering with you just like you're right. trusting and partnering with them. And if you don't trust your doctor, then guess what? There's plenty of us out there. You need to find a new one. I mean, we're <laughs> 2022 year of our Lord. We're at the point in life where we should not just be going to doctors that we don't believe and we don't trust doctors who don't have time of day for us. We get to pick and choose. You could choose. Here's a, here's a quick, here's a quick way. So if you want to just challenge your doctor, he's okay. There's a way to do it effectively. Right. And so the way you do that, I'll say like, let's take hypertension. You want some medication, you start to feel better. You say, you feel like you should be off. Your doctor doesn't want to take out the medication. Well, guess what? If you write down what you've eaten every day, you can show that to your doctor. Doctor, I've changed my diet. If you if you're exercising and you chart, hey, I walked for 30 minutes on this day and I did this on this day and you're hitting your 100, your recommended 150 minutes each week or more each week. And you're able to document that and go in there with your doctor and say, hey, look, doc, I got this whole log for the past month. I've been doing all of these different things. I've cut out sugar. I've done this. I've done that. Then your doctor's going to be more apt to say, you know what? I might be able to lower your doses and we can start doing a step down on your doses of your hypertension. And then and, it, and also you've been taking your blood pressure right throughout the day start off in the morning set your baseline of what your blood pressure is take it throughout the day and you write those down and then you go to your doctor and say doc i haven't had any fluctuations and then then you can start stepping down because he knows hey you're eating right you're exercising and you're checking your your blood pressure on a regular basis but you can't just go in there and say doc i feel better um so i need to be off this medication that they're not going to do that because that's their license that's their practice that's their on the line based on what you're saying. So if you want to challenge your doctor, have some evidence, right? Come in there with, with, a, with a plan and put that plan together and say, here's what I've been doing, doc. And then the doctor will feel more comfortable. I, I promise you that. I love that. And you're absolutely right. You should be documenting for anything you're going to see your doctor for. The questions we're going to ask is, how long has it been going on? Mm -hmm. Has anything made it better, made it worse, right? What have you tried to fix it? Um, and... Um, we're going to be asking questions about your family history, right? And so there's some things that you want to document to have that really important conversation because you know how we are. Oh, a little while now. Oh, it's been going on for a minute. You know, mm -hmm. we got these units of measurement in, in, in black people talk <laughs> that aren't real units for a while now. A couple, you know, a, a few, a couple, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been a minute. <laughs> exactly. Right. Which for us, you know, that could be right. Who knows how long, but it's important for you. If you're going to um, be, if you're going to take charge of your health and you, uh, you take charge of it, right? And that includes becoming an expert in you because when you are the yep. expert in you, your yep. doctor knows you knows better than to, to, to assume that they know more than you or they should. You, if you know you the best, you can advocate the best for yourself. Well, Pam, you again. You might be one of those exceptions, and so we're we're not we can't. Second opinion. You know, hey, Pam, I'm I'm glad it worked out for you. Um, but I, you know, what we're going to there are there are exceptions in every rule, right? And so, uh, but what we're going to recommend, what we would recommend, is that you document everything, you chart it. And then you work with your your healthcare provider. If they're still not, then get a second opinion or find a new healthcare provider. But again, you know, when we start taking ourselves off medication that could be helping us, um, it, we could put ourselves in some jeopardy. We don't want that to happen, right? We don't want that to happen at all. Okay. If you don't have a family history, so Mar, so uh, Maria, that's I, I a good question. I want to comment on on that that statement though, because you know, in, it matters for certain things more than others. And, you know, my, I have cancer patients who are on a pill once a day mm -hmm. to prevent their cancer recurrence. And if I call the pharmacy and find out that they haven't been filling that prescription for years, 
right? Like that's a that's a problem because that's right. helping to prevent your cancer from coming back. But you come to me, come on, mm-hmm, yeah, I'm taking it, doc. Yeah, no, no side effects. <laughs> and so I always dig a little deeper in the questioning. And if you can't tell your doctor the truth, then you need to find a relationship that you can trust. And that's just Dr. Mo speaking sister to sister. It's not medical mm-hmm. advice, but I think that you know if that relationship is is to the point of disrepair where you're you're keeping information from your doctor, why go? Why yeah. go? Yeah. yeah, that's not the relationship for you, Maria. And I know we're coming up on the, on the end of our show, but I'm going to ask, answer this last question, and then we're going to wrap up. What about people who don't have a family history? Yes, yeah, so somebody might be adopted, they might be in foster care, they don't know what's going on in terms of their family history. That's the beauty of what we talked about earlier: genetic testing, right? And so that genetic testing has become a, a it's a godsend, right? So that scientific breakthrough can give you what what you're susceptible to, and your doctor can help break that down. So you. So having a family history is great, yes, but there's that's not the only barrier. That's not the only way that you can find out what's going on with you. Genetic testing, yes, it costs, but aren't you worth it? When your car breaks down, don't you pay to get it fixed? When you, you know, how many TVs do you have? Like how many things we spend money on? We should be spending money on the most important thing to us, and that's our health. Because without our health, we can't do any of the other things that we enjoy doing in our, in our lives effectively. So spend a little money, get genetic testing, and then let that that test will tell you what your markers are and what you're susceptible to, even without a family history. And let's talk about that because, you know, we used to only give genetic testing, hereditary testing, like for things like cancer, to people who had the family history. But now it's opened up to people who don't know their family history because because of that very thing. You're not as likely to have a mutation because only 5 to 10 percent, let's say cancers, for example, 10 percent of cancers are caused by a familial hereditary mutation, which means 90 percent of people's aren't. But if you're in that 10%, your risk for getting that cancer is so much higher, whether it's Mm -hmm. colon, breast, melanoma, prostate, pancreatic, uterine, gastric, stomach cancers. um, I think I covered all uterine (laughs) cancers, uh, thyroid, some thyroid cancers. Like that stuff can run in families. And if you don't know your family history, then yeah, most of the companies now are doing these panel tests for about $249, $250. They're Mm -hmm. mailing the kits to your house now. Mm -hmm. And so it's really something that you may want to consider. Sometimes you will have to see a genetic counselor to get your insurance to cover it, especially with no family history. They have to document that you were adopted and all the things, but it is very much, um, very much worth it to know what you were born with because the genes don't lie. You got what you got from mom and dad, 50, 50, you know, and we can know if you're at higher risk for certain diseases, certain cancers, certain types of depression, dementia. Like we're learning mm-hmm. so much more about what what runs in our families through the genes that even the family history doesn't know. Because, you know, we don't know all our family history. You know, folks, you know, uh, Aunt Mabel had the sugar and, you know, Aunt Connie had something down there. <laughs> and we don't know if it was uterine, cervical or ovarian cancer. It was just down there. So, you know, family history isn't everything. That that verbal family history is important to know if you can get it. But if you don't have it, we work with what you got. We got we got to share more though, black black folks. We can't be ginger ale can't ginger ale rubbing alcohol and tussing can't can't solve all our ills. Okay. We got, we, got to, we got we got technology that can help us. Uh the last thing I'm gonna say is you gotta work with your healthcare provider. Yeah. If you're if you're if they're not working with you you got a problem. You got to find somebody that you're going to work with, right? Because it's your health. You're driving your health up. You're driving your health option outcomes more than your doctor is, right? So we can't blame the doctor because the doctor only sees you a few times. You, you drive it with everything that you eat, everything that you do, your inactivity or a level of activity, what you put in your body, you're driving your health outcomes more than what your doctor is. So understand that. And now you work with your doctor by telling them the truth, how, how much you're eating, what you're eating, how much you're exercising. Be honest with them so y'all can have a come to Jesus meeting and say, look, this is what you need to do. But you got to have that relationship. If you're not building that relationship, then that is that is shame on you. Right. So we've got to do a better job of developing a better relationship with our health care provider and work with them so we can have better health outcomes. I agree with that. And, you know, the last the last part of our segment, we always do. What's the cancer connection? I feel like the whole show we have (laughs) talked about the cancer connection here today. But I want to put in a plug for, you know, it's Women's History Month. And what's the cancer connection between us, between black women and cancer? And our community is is actually a good connection. We not we not new to this. We true to this. Dr. Jane Cook Wright. 
Yes. Dr. Jane Cook Wright, known as Dr. Jane Jones, was considered the mother of chemotherapy. Did y'all know that chemotherapy was discovered, invented, optimized by a black woman, a mm. researcher, right, who went to uh, New York Medical College. I think she went to Howard, and then she ended up at Harlem Hospital. But she developed, her and her dad, developed an optimized chemotherapy, methotrexate, to treat breast cancer and skin cancers. So, you know, when you're looking at the medical community and the medical establishment, and you're looking at it as this, this otherness, right? It's mm -hmm. time for us to begin to reclaim that legacy of us in medicine and us in healthcare, that we are not separate from these things. We right. have contributed to these things. Our knowledge of how the body has self-healing mechanisms of medicine, of dentistry goes back to ancient chemic, right? We mm -hmm. are the best and most reliable source of information about our bodies, our minds, bodies, and spirits. It's us, right? The secret to all of our wellness is in our own genes. And as black people, we need to recognize that and we need to stop the distance between us and medicine. We can work together. Your Western medicine, if you need a medication, if you got to go see a doctor, if you need a surgery, if you need some chemo, whatever it is, can work with what you believe about your body's self-healing mechanism. Mm -hmm. The two things can work together. Yes, you can absolutely change your diet, change your life, change your spirituality, change your mind and your how you perceive your body and your wellness, and it will begin to change your wellness. One of my girlfriends who's watching, Juliet, I'm calling you out, four time different, four different cancers, four time metastatic cancer person whose mind, her very mind and her will to live right now is beating every cancer that life has thrown at her. The doctors don't know what to do with her. They can't, they, they, they like the cancers keep going away. So yeah, we got it, we got it in us, but it's not separate from medicine. It's the source mm -hmm. of medicine, it is the source of knowledge and it lives inside of us. So that's the cancer connection and it's a good connection. That's the one good connection we got is that the answers are within us. I can't say it any, any better. So with that, we're going to sign off. Thank you. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, today's the first. We'll be back on the, uh, that was at the 15th. We'll be back on March 15th here. What to know from Dr. Mo? Tell a friend. I want to give a shout out to somebody who's been tagging all of your friends. I would appreciate that. I appreciate what you're doing there. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, you, you, you've you been so active today. Thank you, uh, Lucia, and everybody that's been active. Valerie. Appreciate your comments, Edwina. Thank you so much. Ask your questions. Tell a friend. We'll be back in two weeks. What to know from Dr. Mo right here on BlackDoctor.org, getting your questions answered. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Triple negative breast cancer day is Thursday. Tag a friend. Tell them what triple negative breast cancer is. Tell them to get their mammogram. Stay get safe. it. Get it. <laughs>